You're finally meeting his family of eight over a home-cooked meal big enough for 30 when you need to bake a keister casserole. Hi, uh, where is the restroom? Uh, it's right behind you. Right behind me? Oh, that is convenient. Now what do you do? He's really hot. Most of the time I get real big trolls. I need you to help me out. Bowel elimination. It's a physiologic function that we need and we need every day. And we probably don't think too much about it unless things go out of whack. And then boy, it can awfully be very embarrassing. Today we're going to talk about bowel elimination. You're going to need Giddens chapter 17 and Davis chapter 29 to get through this very stinky subject. You're going to need your concept study guide version B to complete that um, throughout the lecture. And then we're going to accomplish these goals on our screen today. You can pause this to read through them. Um, and remember, elimination is one nursing concept that we're dividing into two lectures, one on urinary elimination and today on bowel elimination. So let's go ahead and define and describe the concept of bowel elimination. Now, just like it is for urinary elimination, elimination is defined as excretion of waste from the body. So therefore, bowel elimination is the passage and dispelling of stool um, through the intestinal tract by means of intestinal smooth muscle contractions. Some key terms that you'll want to know for bowel elimination include defecation, uh, which means passing of bowel, uh, bowel movement or passing of stool. Um, continence, which is the ability to purposely control fecal elimination. Incontinence, which is the loss of control of elimination of feces um, or urine, but in this case feces. And then the retention is like constipation, um, keeping materials within the body that should be expelled. Again, here's a few more uh, key terms for you. Feces is the semi-solid mass of fiber, undigested food, and inorganic material that passes through our digestive tract and becomes stool in the intestinal tract. Motility is the coordinated movements of the stomach and intestinal tract to move materials along the GI tract. And then impaction is a large hard lump of stool that is dry and is stuck in the rectum and unable to pass. So we need to recognize when an individual has problems with bowel elimination. Now the scope of this concept is the same as it was for urinary elimination. Um, it includes waste formation and excretion and ranges from efficient to impaired elimination. So let's go ahead and review the anatomy and the physiology of bowel, of the bowels. So of course, um, your GI tract is not going to include your colon, your rectum, and the anus. Peristalsis is the movement of the uh, contractions of the intestines to move things along. A sphincter is what tightens to hold in the stool at the rectum until you're ready to release that. And the gastrocolic reflex is engaged and tells the intestines how quickly to move and uh, move food through the bowels uh, based on the receptors that indicate how much food is in the stomach, how much is being ingested, um, and it knows how then quickly to move. So when our, after we've eaten a meal, the gastrocolic reflex en engages to engage our digestive system to kind of pick up the pace a little bit. Now I've included a five minute A&P video from Khan Academy down in the description box. So I would encourage you to pause here and just review that quick um, A&P video as well. So the variations in context are the same as that of urinary elimination. You can have fecal incontinence, the inability to control uh, the release of feces. Retention of stool, like constipation um, or impaction, where you're retaining stool and unable to release it from the body. Discomfort, either from um, hard stools or increased gas. Um, infections, um, such as C. diff, is one we see in the hospital a lot. In inflammatory bowel diseases, 
neoplasms like cancers, and then finally organ failures as well. Organ failure specific when it comes to bowel can happen when there is a torsion or twisting of the bowel that uh, cuts off blood flow to that area or any other reason that the blood flow to the organ itself um, is being reduced. Because just like every part of our body, organs need blood flow in order to survive. So the loss of control, incontinence, this involuntary release of feces um, can lead to sp skin breakdown and it can be very distressing, especially for the social world of the patient. And they oftentimes will adjust their daily activities to match their bowel needs or even change their social relationships um, because of embarrassment or need to be accessing a toilet. Now, bowel retention um, can happen for a variety of reasons. It can be because of the ignoring the urge to go. The longer that fecal material remains in the intestines, the more water is going to be absorbed from that and it will get drier and harder. This happens a lot with um, toddlers who are learning to potty train and they get scared to use the toilet to relieve their bowels and so they can ignore that urge to go and then have constipation as a problem. The other reason you can have bowel retention is decreased peristalsis. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. Oftentimes, opioids um, is one of the main reasons for this. Um, and, and that is because the, the opioids themselves reduce the contractility of the bowel. And this can lead to a retention of stool in the rectum. The stool gets drier and harder because more water is absorbed by the intestines. And it can cause constipation. Um, where it's very hard to pass the stool or even impaction where it's impossible and that stool is stuck in the rectum. So let's talk about risk factors that place individuals at risk for um, bowel elimination issues. So really all populations, all ages, genders, or races are potentially at risk for um, problems with bowel elimination, but there are a few populations we could focus on for greatest risk. Um, specifically children, especially those who are learning to toilet and again are fearful of, of passing bowel uh, stool on the toilet. Um, or even um, school age children who maybe don't have enough time in their school day to take the time they need to pass their bowels. Pregnant women can have problems with um, bowel elimination as the fetus grows and takes up more area in their belly. There's not enough room for um, the stool, the intestines, and they can cause constipation. And finally, older adults can also have problems with bowel elimination. And this is because of an atrophy or re re uh, a weakening of the smooth muscle layer of their intestines, as well as a decreased mucus production, which helps to lubricate and pass stool along the intestinal tract. Now your Davis text discussed a few other factors for bowel elimination, and a few that I want to highlight here are things like nutrition status and, and the amount of fiber in one's diet. The more fiber, the more bulky stool and stool that's easier to pass. Um, hydration status, the more you're hydrated, the better your bowel passage will be. And mo mobility, activity actually helps move bowel through the intestines through additional movement. So if you think of peristalsis helping to move bowel through the intestine, well, just moving around and ambulating, ambulating means walking, ambulating around is going to also help move things along that track. So any patients who are struggling with nutrition or hydration or are bed, bed bound are gonna have problems or could have problems with bowel elimination. Certain medications like we discussed can impact bowel elimination and surgeon, certain procedures or surgeries can also impact that. So what kind of things would we notice with an individual have, who has problems with bowel elimination? Well, the three main problems we're going to see with bowel elimination include stool retention, either impaction or constipation like we talked about, fecal incontinence, being unable to hold one's uh, stool, or bowel discomfort. Um, and that can be uh, kind of a crampy abdominal pain or it can be something more like a gas pain and a feeling of fullness. 
Here are some problems or nursing diagnoses specific to uh, bowel elimination. Things like bowel incontinence or constipation, chronic constipation, meaning it's happened for a long time, a risk for constipa of constipation, certainly any of your patients who are on opioids after a surgery or a bed bound are at risk of constipation because we know the related factors and causes for that. Um, diarrhea, which is watery stools, gastrointestinal motility alteration. So either the, the gastrointestines are moving too fast and passing things too quickly, or moving too slowly and not passing them quick enough. Remember, too fast, and there's not gonna be enough time for that fecal matter to have the water appropriately absorbed into the intestines before being eliminated from the body, causing diarrhea. And too slow, too much of that uh, water is absorbed from the stool by the intestines, causing the, the constipation and the stool to be too hard and dry. And then finally, toileting self-care. So for whatever reason, a patient is unable to provide uh, their own uh, self-care when it comes to toileting. So what kind of findings would you see um, with a patient who has retention of stool? Well, you could palpate, meaning touch or feel, a hard mass in the lower abdomen uh, when the rectum is filled with a large amount of stool. Um, it can often be filled, uh, felt upon digital uh, examination, meaning using a finger um, in the rectum to actually feel the large amount of stool. Or you could observe excessive stool in the colon on radiographs like x-rays or CAT scans. And on children, you might see retentive posturing um, where they're really trying to hold in their stool intentionally. Let me show you what that looks like. So here's an example of retentive posturing in a child. The legs are straight on their tips toes, their buttocks are clenched, their back is arched. Um, and it can be mistaken as for, by parents as straining or pain but it's really just trying to retain or hold in their stool for whatever reason they're, they're scared to pass their stool. So common symptoms are gonna include things like abdominal cramping, bloating, a liquid, leakage of liquid feces around the impaction. So if there's a really hard, dry, large mass of stool in the rectum, the rest of the bowel is still trying to get past it. And so the only thing that can get past it is little bits of like very watery diarrhea. And so you can have diarrhea while you're constipated because a little bit of stool is leaking around the impaction. You may notice rectal bleeding from the straining uh, from, the, from pat, trying to pass the stool. Um, you might notice very small semi-formed stools where just little bits of stool are being passed. Now, bowel incontinence, on the other hand, is the involuntary release of stool. So uh, we have an external sphincter that I'll, we can consciously release that when it's time to pass stool when we want to. Um, but when patients lack the ability to uh, control that sphincter, then they'll have an involuntary release of stool or bowel incontinence or fecal incontinence. Now the final finding we can off, uh, often see is discomfort in the bowel elimination. And we would see things like abdominal pain or cramping. Sometimes this is intermittent where it comes and goes. Um, the sensation of rectal pressure if there's a lot of stool sitting in the rectum. And anal soreness or burning from straining and um, micro tears, micro fissures right at the anus from the uh, tissue trying to stretch to accommodate the large amount of stool. So when we're doing an assessment for bowel elimination, we're first going to take a health history. We're going to ask about things like typical toilet toileting patterns, any changes in diet or changing in toileting patterns and what might have led to that. When we're assessing, we're going to assess both the patient and the stool. And so when we're inspecting the abdomen, we're going to look for any distension, meaning any bloating and in uh, increased size in the abdomen. We can auscultate for bowel sounds. We're going to listen in all four quadrants with the bell side of our uh, stethoscope. And remember, when we're auscultating for bowel sounds, we're listening in every quadrant for a minute. And within that minute, we should hear between five and 30 um, bowel sounds, little clicks or gurgles or, um, yeah, little air movement sounds. About five to 30 in a minute would be normal. 
anything more than that would be um, too many vowel sounds. Um, and anything less than that would be hypoactive vowel sounds. Hyperactive means more than normal or hypoactive would be low. And then absent vowel sounds, you'd have to um, auscultate to listen for three to five minutes with absolutely hearing no vowel sounds whatsoever to determine that a patient had absent vowel sounds. So we're going to inspect the patient's abdomen. We can also look at the rectum, looking for any hemorrhoids, bleeding, anything like that. Um, the presence of stool, if you're seeing that right at the um, anal opening. And then we can palpate the abdomen, um, noting that the abdomen should be soft, it should be non-tender, and it should be non-distended. Now, when we're looking at the stool sample itself, we're looking for a normal brownish color. Um, we're looking for a good formed stool. Anything too liquidy would indicate diarrhea. Anything very hard and firm would indicate that the bowel is moving too slowly. And um, liquidy diarrhea can indicate things like an infection um, or some kind of inflammatory process. And constipation, of course, can be related to things like medications, um, hydration, and nutrition status. Now, obviously, bright red bleed blood in the uh, feces would be an abnormal finding indicating a GI bleeding, but also a very dark um, stool can indicate a GI bleed as well. So very dark stools that are black or tarry can end indicate a GI bleed, a gastrointestinal bleed, something that you'd want to have addressed right away. Now, certainly there are lab tests that can be done on stool samples and occult blood is going to attest for the presence of blood in the stool that may not be visible to the naked eye. You can also culture it to see what kind of bacteria or pathogens are, are, um, are growing in the stool or living in the stool. Um, and you can do a pathology where they take small samples of the intestinal tissue um, to check them for things like cancer. Uh, and then, of course, there's direct observation tests like a colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, or an EGD that are all done in, in the GI lab to vis directly visualize the GI tract. And then, of course, uh, you can see different components of the, of the bowel system in the radiographic tests and scans, like CAT scans and x-rays specifically.